one of the big, biggest players, and probably the game's best hitter, is on the market right now. And there is a definitive move to make and a move to not make. Let's talk Juan Soto and do a little digging in. What makes the Juan Soto situation so fascinating is that it does make sense for the Nationals to deal him. Soto is under club control for this season and then the next two seasons. That's a lot of time. Three playoff runs with the game's elite hitter for the club that trades for him. But for the Nationals, they're unlikely to be a playoff team in that time frame and having been unable to lock him up long term should act now. So Soto is among the game's best players. Here are the player rankings by war over the last three seasons. Now this is a large sample, but it's a recent sample as well. The top five are all within a half a win above replacement of each other. War being an approximation, small differences like that are negligible. So they're essentially the same. 13.4, 12.8, it's nothing. Juan Soto is right there with Jose Ramirez, Paul Goldschmidt, Aaron Judge, Trey Turner. By the way, they're just above Manny Machado, Freddie Freeman, Mookie Betts, Mike Trout, he's been injured too much, and he is not even in the top 40. The point being, these are the game's best players, and when one becomes available, it's a seismic move for a franchise. Think of the impact of Machado and Harper on their new clubs, or Judge's impact now on the Yankees, or Paul Goldschmidt's resurgence for the Cardinals. It's a team game, but these guys move the meter. Where Soto separates himself is his plate discipline, combined with his power and contact. First off, there are only a handful of players that slug 500 and do so with the elite or top 25 contact skills. Soto, Jose Ramirez, Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, Kyle Tucker, Nolan Arenado. Power is still where it's at, but contact hitting in this current low run scoring environment becomes an even more important skill. And there are, by the way, I thought this was interesting, only two guys in baseball that have a low chase, high contact, high power game in this class. And that's Juan Soto and Mookie Betts. These are the only two, with, with, with all three, at the high elite levels. I won't bore you with all the numbers. You see the percentages, everything else. But we set the bar high, and only these two do all three. Slugging, contact, and do not chase. Oh, swing. Don't chase the ball out of the strike zone at this level. Soto's discipline and pitch recognition is the best in the game. Over the last three seasons, he is number one in not chasing pitches out of the strike zone. That's O swing percentage and has far and away the highest walk rate in the majors. Soto had old player skills as a teenager, and that process is something that usually ages quite well. Now, pointing out Soto's defense and base running is like complaining about Ted Williams' defense and base running. but. If you're comparing Williams to DiMaggio, you have to bring it up. If you're wondering about overall value, it's something to be aware of. Soto's sprint speed is now in the 26th percentile. So he's 23, but he's not springy. He's not fast. Over the last three years, Soto is already well into the negative in base running runs. Zero is league average, and he's minus 3.5 this year. The fielding is a mystery as well. Last year, Soto was an above average outfielder for the first time in his career. He finished the season plus four in defensive runs saved and plus five in outs above average. That's the stack cast metric, so that's good. This year, he's had some very loud, bad plays, and he's currently negative three in defensive runs saved, negative eight in outs above average. So this is a big question. <clears throat> Is he a decent defender like he was last year, or is he rapidly approaching the DH position? You know what? His next club gets Soto age 23, 24, and 25. That's worth a couple of blue, blue chippers. If I'm a GM right now, I'll let the team that signs him to a 10-year deal worry about his defense. Juan Soto is worth more now than he will be then. All right, back with our all-pundit panel. What I'm saying is, I really don't want him for 10 to 15 years, but I want him the next three. I think if you have to give up whatever you have to give up to get him now and let somebody else spend 400 million, do that. Yeah, I think it's one of the reasons, for example, San Diego's in it with their better prospects. I think, for, personally, I think San Diego has the right attitude. I think prospects have become too overvalued in yeah. our, our sport. If you were allowed to trade draft picks, and I told you, you have to trade your next five number one draft picks for him, because there's not a name attached to it, you'd probably do it. But once they're in your system and you start thinking, oh, this guy says, no one's going to be as valuable as this guy for two plus years. Right. Nobody. You know, and you probably get a more engaged defender and base runner on a contender than you're getting on Washington right now. I mean, I'm, I wish that weren't true, but right. you probably mm -hmm. do get that. Right. But you're obviously bringing him in to hit. You put up him in Mookie Betts. If you had all your money on the line in Game 7 of a World Series and you had to send somebody to the plate, those are the two guys I'd send to the plate. Mm -hmm. Right. I think they're the two best at bats in a pressure situation. They, they're going to hit the ball. 
They're usually going to hit it hard. You know, like, those are the guys. And what's that worth? That's right. worth your best prospects. Right. I, it's, as I'm looking at this, it's funny. As I'm writing it, it, it just hit me. It should have hit me before that, Sean. Sometimes I take a while. But as I'm writing it, I realize, no, no, no. The sweepstakes are right now. Like, I'm not yeah. three years down the line. I don't want that 10-year. I've written this many times. I don't want a 10-year deal for a guy when he's 38, 39, 40. But do I want him now, 24 and 25? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll do, I'll, yeah. I think teams will do almost I will, anything. I will say a 10-year deal will only put him at 33, not 38, 39, 35. Uh, 40. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that the Cardinals and the Padres look like the two favorites. I think the Dodgers are still in it, but <clears throat> very interesting because these two teams do a great job of gathering prospects, but we've got the Padres who are always willing to take a chance, and the Cardinals who have been generally conservative. It's going to be an interesting thing to see which one wins. I think we kind of think the Padres are favored but only because of the past and the fact that they have been aggressive. A lot had to happen to have this happen. Like the Nationals had been actually a very consistent and had been an elite team for a long time. And then even if it wasn't new ownership on the way, you know, if they weren't going to be selling the club, a lot had to happen to put Soto out there, not with like just next year. Like, hey, get him this year, next year, which is the norm, right? Two more years of this guy. That changes the whole thing, right? Yeah, I mean, the Nationals obviously wouldn't trade the last few years. They won a championship in 2019 and had been very competitive for the five or six years before that, right? right? But it hasn't gone well since then. Patrick Corbin, who helped them win a championship, has been arguably the worst starting pitcher in the sport who's used regularly since then. Steven Strasburg, who they then gave $245 million to his hardly hasn't even, I think, made 10 starts mm -hmm. since then. So, like, that's a lot of money on your payroll. It's two of the guys, like, if they're pitching, like, number one and two starters, you're probably not trading Juan Soto. A new mm -hmm. owner's thrilled to take over, take all of them. But they're not going to be good for a while. And so, again, like the Otani question, uh, is this the moment to cash him in for as many chips towards your next good team as possible? Right. I think that's where they are. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, like, just why isn't there a mystery team? You're the mystery team guy. Well, the why isn't there? Team... I mean, if it's only right, if it's if it's prospects, yeah. I, I brought up Cleveland last sure. week, and it's just prospects, and you're going to be paying them 20 million. Well, they can swing that. Why? Why well, wouldn't there, there be other? There teams certainly around? can be mystery teams. The mystery team generally is introduced in the free agency period, but you can have mystery teams for <laughs> trades <laughs> Bring too. Bring that out, John. Uh, you know, I think this is a player that's. The, one of the best players in the game, and we're all investigating it. And I, hopefully we would have uncovered if there's some real mystery to this team. I mean, we had St. Louis and, Sa and San Diego as the two teams almost right from the start. So, you know, we could be surprised. Castillo, we thought, was Yankees or Dodgers, and here come the Mariners. So you never know. But this one's dragged out a little longer. No surprise, the best player in the game, one of the best players in the game. And we've done a little bit more work on this. So... Hopefully we're not wrong, and hopefully it's one of the teams that we've been projecting. Here you can say, well, they have the best prospects and the second best pro It's not going to be a team with bad prospects, right? And it's right. not going to be a team that is not in contention. So you can eliminate a lot of teams. But uh, now half the league's in contention, right? I mean, True. essentially. Right. So I, I, think so that, I thought that would open up some fringes, whether it's like, I haven't said, like Brewers, White Sox, Cleveland, I don't know who else, yeah. but, you know, someone who's, say, who th or Colorado, who we didn't think would be getting Chris Bryant, and suddenly, no, we can win now. Really? Right. Okay, but they might think that. Well, I, to one of the points you made before is if you're borderline now, you're like, okay, does this guy take us off the borderline and in it? And if not, we still got him for two more years. If right. you're one of the smaller teams, you could always, if you're not in it next year or the year after, you could go trade him again, probably recoup 75, 80% of what you gave up in a trade. So, like, for example, I know Tampa Bay made a bunch of phone calls on right, this guy right. once they heard oh this is the price we don't think we can meet that price they said okay what's the other logical group of outfielders that could help us on offense until you know like we get some guys back like Margot and Ramirez mm -hmm. and Wando Franco and they ended up with David Peralta right like another kind of guy on the margins just to try to help but they went after Freddie Freeman in the offseason. They know the that. difference. Yeah, right. They know <laughs> the difference making players. Yeah. And organizations like that that generally don't spend are like we'll spend if we could get a guy who changes our championship chances dramatically. Right. No. Yeah, I, was I think gonna, it's yeah. tough for Tampa because they need those cheap yes. assets, right? They need those guys to come up and perform for them at a minimum salary. If they trade them all away, you know, then I think their payroll gets out of, away from them. San no. Diego has done such a great job from a business standpoint. It's changed the equation. Remember when they couldn't afford Chase Headley? Now they've got 
signed for Hosmer for over $100 million, Machado for $300 million, uh, Tatis for $341 million. Uh, it's pretty amazing what's going on in San Diego. Right, now it's new uh, ownership leadership. Right, yeah. So they have a different thing. And the Chargers not in town anymore. That helps. Yeah, and uh, we've seen it even the last few years. Not even Tatis has been hurt. But when you watch a game in San Diego like it is, and it matters, turning on the revenue machine, when your fan base is energized, yes. when they're excited, and they've got superstars there, it'd be exciting. I'm, I'm just rooting for a little, the little guy. Yeah, yeah, the little, little guy. Little rays, you know, gritty yeah. and gutty. And that, <laughs> that sort San of Diego's not as small as we think. Uh, no, 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 no. It's a 12th market. Yeah, no, I meant even. Now they're playing more. like a big market. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right.